All right, as promised, I have a kinematic equations problem for you guys. Specifically, we have a free fall problem. We're going to throw a ball straight up off the top of a 12 meter high cliff, which means that this distance right here and our little drawing below is 12 meters. And we're going to throw that ball up with a speed of nine meters per second. And we want to find a few different things the maximum height above the ground reached by the ball, how much time passes from the throw until the ball passes you on the way back down, and with what speed the ball strikes the ground. So the trajectory of the ball will look something like this. It'll go up first, reach its peak, and then come back down and strike the ground. We have a few different moments of interest here because we have the launch, the maximum height, which happens up here. Then we want to know how much time passes from the throw until we passed, the ball passes us on the way back down. And we also want to know something about when the ball hits the ground. So we really have four moments that we're concerned about in this problem. I like to label these as my snapshots, labeling them one, two, three, and four, because it will help us keep track of everything that we're trying to do later. But as always, the first step is recognizing this as a free fall problem and as a kinematic equations problem. And the easiest way to see that is to see that we're given information that says 12 meters. That sounds like a position or a displacement to me. Nine meters per second, that's a speed or a velocity and we're asked for the maximum height, how much time passes, and the speed with which the ball strikes the ground. These are all variables of motion. And when a problem gives you variables of motion and asks for variables of motion, that is a kinematic equations problem. And this is a free fall problem because this object, the ball, is airborne the whole time, acted on only by gravity. And when that's true, for all free fall problems, you automatically know the acceleration. So based on a coordinate system where up is positive, for all free fall problems, the acceleration is going to be 9.80 meters per second squared and that will be directed down towards the earth and since we picked up for positive that means down is negative so that a needs a negative sign so let's start off with part a here for part a we want to know the maximum height reached by the ball so that's something that talks specifically about snapshot two. So with multiple different points of interest going on, we need to clearly select our initial and final points. So for part A, for my initial point, I'm going to pick snapshot one because we already know something about snapshot one, which we'll see in a second. For my final point, if I'm going to find out the maximum height of the ball, which happens at snapshot 2, that better be included somewhere. So I'm going to make my final snapshot 2. So now we can start to figure out what variables we know. So V initial for this section is the velocity at snapshot 1, which we already have. That's that 9.0 meters per second and it is directed upward, so positive. V final here is going to be the velocity at snapshot two, and snapshot two is at the very peak of this trajectory, and at the peak of a free fall trajectory, the velocity is zero. Don't forget that we also know the acceleration, negative 9.80 meters per second squared, and what we're trying to find is the maximum height above the ground reached by the ball. So 
we want a height in one way or another, so we're going to have to find our delta y here. So that's going to be our goal. So now we go looking for an equation that has the variables we need, these variables right here in our kinematic equations. So the equation that we need is vf squared equals vi squared plus 2a delta y. And then from that, we know everything except the displacement, so we can just start plugging in. So we have 0 squared equals positive 9.0 meters per second, that whole thing squared, plus 2 times the acceleration, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, times our delta y. And then we can work through the math here to solve for our delta y. And we get a value of about 4.1 meters. Sorry, just checking my math here. Yep, 4.13 meters. And we get a positive value for that, which we do expect because from snapshot one to snapshot two, the ball has gone up. But that delta y is only from snapshot one to snapshot two. So we should always check what the problem actually asks for. And this problem is asking for the height above the ground. So if we want the height above the ground, we're going to have to take the height of the cliff, that 12 meters, and then add this extra height that we get to it, 4.13 meters, to get our final answer of, with a little bit of rounding, 16.1 meters above the ground is our answer for part A here. Then we can move on to part 2 here or part B. Part B is asking for how much time passes from the throw until the ball passes you on the way back down. So this part of the problem is really telling you which parts to use as initial and final. They want to know the time from the throw, and the throw happens at snapshot one, until the ball passes you on the way back down, which happens at snapshot three. So that means our delta y from before in part A, we can't use that anymore, because that's not the same delta y anymore, because we've moved our final point. But we haven't moved our initial point. Our v initial here is still v1, and we still know that one as positive 9 meters per second. Our acceleration, we always know in free fall problems, negative 9.80 meters per second squared. And I think it's pretty clear that what we're really looking for here is t since they asked how much time passes. But in almost every kinematic equations problem, you're going to need three things that you know before you can start to uh, look for equations. And here, the last thing that we know is actually delta y. And if you remember, delta y is y final minus y initial, which for this problem, we haven't actually listed our y values yet, but let's put them over here just to see. So y4 down here, let's just say that that's zero down at the ground. That means that y1 is at the top of the cliff, and that's 12 meters above y4. y3 
is at the same height as y1. It's when the ball passes you on the way back down at the same height from which it was thrown. So also 12 meters. And then in the first part, we actually already found y2 as that 16.1 meters. So for part B back over here, our final height is y3, our initial height is y1, and we can see that we have the same height at y snapshot 1 and snapshot 3, which means our starting and final positions are the same for part B, so we have a displacement of 0. Now again, we've, we know three things and we're looking for one more, so we go hunting for a kinematic equation that has these variables in it to see if we can solve this in one step. Let me draw a little dividing line there. And the equation here is delta y equals vi t plus one half a t squared. So we can just start plugging in here. Our delta y is zero. Our initial velocity is positive 9.0 meters per second times the time, which we do not know, plus one-half times the acceleration, negative 9.80 meters per second squared, times t squared again. Now you might be worried that you're going to have to solve a quadratic equation here, but because this delta y is zero, it turns out you actually don't have to. So let me rewrite this equation once to show you why and I'm gonna drop my units here to make it very clear. So dropping our units, we have 9t minus 4.9t squared equals zero. And if I divide both sides of this equation by t, on the left, zero divided by t is still just zero. Nine divided by t is nine. Negative 4.9t squared divided by t is negative 4.9t. So this is easy enough to solve for the t that we want, and that t is going to be 9 divided by 4.9, which turns out to be 1.84 seconds. Which is the value we were asked for so we can just box that right now because it's what we're looking for. On to the third part of the problem. C, part C, is asking for with what speed the ball strikes the ground at the bottom of the cliff. So that's telling you that your final position here better be snapshot four. For your initial position, you have a few different choices here. It's helpful to pick something that you already know, a snapshot that you already know a lot of information about, and we seem to know the most about snapshot one, so I'm going to keep snapshot one as our initial point. Then we go back and identify what variables we know, what variables we don't. Our V initial is still just v1 because we've kept our initial point at 1, so it's still that positive 9.0 meters per second. We still know our acceleration is negative 9.80 meters per second squared. And we're looking for with what speed the ball strikes the ground at the bottom of the cliff, so that is v final or v4 in this problem is the one we're looking for. But we're gonna need one more variable here. And it turns out that, again, we know our delta y, which is y final, so that's y4, minus y initial, which is y1. So, oops, that should be a one, there we go. Our final height is zero meters, and our initial height was 12 meters. So our delta y here is going to be negative 
12 meters. You could also just think directly about the displacement. From snapshot 1 to snapshot 4, the ball has moved 12 meters down in terms of its displacement. The 12 meters for that magnitude and the down giving you that negative sign. Again, we end up looking at the variables we know and the variables we're looking for to try to pick an equation that can help us here. And it ends up being the same equation we used in part A, but with a different delta y this time. So our v final we do not know, so we just leave our v4 that we're trying to find alone. Our v initial was this positive 9.0 meters per second squared plus 2 times our acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared times our displacement of negative 12 meters. And then from this, we can work through everything and solve for V4. Or actually, let me show you just another line of math here. So 9 meters per second, the whole thing squared means you square the number to get 81, and then you have to square the units as well, meters squared per second squared. And then we take 2 times negative 9.8 times negative 12, and with a little bit of rounding, that gives us a plus 235. And for our units here, well, we had meters per second squared, and then times meters makes it meters squared on the top. So that means V4 equals 81 plus 235, or 316. Sorry, V4 squared equals 316 meters squared per second squared. And now we can take the square root of both sides here now that we just have one number on each side. And the square root of our 316 gives us V4 equals 17.8 meters per second. This is the speed we want, but just in case this problem asks for velocity, remember, when you take the square root in your algebra, you have to decide whether the number should be positive or negative because 2 times 2 is 4, but negative 2 times negative 2 is also 4. So for this one, we want to go over here in our diagram and think about snapshot 4. Is the ball moving up or down at that point? And I think the answer is pretty clearly the ball is moving down, so that means we need a negative sign on this V4 for it to be our final velocity. And then that means that the final speed here is just 17.8 meters per second. No positives and no negatives because speed is a scalar. So these are far from the only things that someone could ask you to find in this problem. They could ask you to find how much time passes between the peak and the ground. So when the ball's at the very top at snapshot two and when the ball strikes the ground at snapshot four. For something like that, you might make two your initial point and four your final point. But organizing your work like this, keeping track of what your initial and final points are in complex multi-part problems will be very helpful, both in terms of you need to do that to get the right answer. And in terms of when you look back at your problem later, you'll notice that we have three different delta y's just on this one page. And I'm going to circle them in orange for you. We had delta y is 4.13 meters, delta y is 0, and delta y is negative 12 meters. Oops. Delta y is negative 12 meters. 
So if you just wrote this all down in one big mess on your paper and you go back to look at it later, you're not going to be able to tell what you were doing and which part of the problem you were talking about. So try to organize your solutions in some way so that you can clearly see when you look back at them which were your initial points, which were your final points, and make sure you keep all of that straight. Just to kind of make things clear, let's say I took my initial point as 2 and my final point as 4. That would mean my V initial is now V2. And we already decided that the velocity at the peak of this path was zero. So that means for that initial and final point, my V initial would be zero. This V initial zero here is the same as this V final equals zero over here. So this one point in time, the peak of the trajectory, for some parts of the problem, it could be your initial. For some parts of the problem, it could be your final. So when the initials and finals get a little weird, you can always come back to this one, two, three, four, the snapshots I labeled. V2 won't always be V initial. It won't always be final, but it will always be V2. And that can help you to organize your solutions a little bit. So hopefully this helps, and I will see you all on Friday.